So we get started. So we continue now with the, the next lecture. And let me briefly introduce to you Paolo Barbani. Paolo is, is also a member of the uh, Sonder Forschungsbereich, this SFB, which is a research center, which we have at uh, Munich. And uh, Paolo uh, is working at the ESO, which is a senior, senior uh, scientist, senior astronomer senior astronomer at the ESO, and he's the expert of blazers. Basically, he is one of the, the founding fathers of blazer classifications. So, um, and he will tell you everything you want to know about uh, yeah, the astrophysics side of the messenger astronomy and high energy power. Okay, is this working fine? Okay. Uh, thanks, Stefan. So, it's very nice to be here. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Stefan said, I work at ESO, European Central Observatory in Garten, close to Munich. I'm a multi wavelength astronomer with an interest in high energy astrophysics and neutrinos. And the timing of this school is perfect for the topic of my lectures. Uh, less than two months ago, we witnessed the birth of a new branch of astronomy, which is very rare. Uh, the birth of non stellar neutrino astrophysics, which is connected to. to connected to. Multimetric Physics and AGN, which is, stands for Active Galactic Nuclei. So, um, and you've already seen the press release, all the, the newspapers and all that. Despite what uh, some people said during some interviews, we were expecting this. Uh, so, the, the first lecture, I'm going to give you the, back, the background story. Uh, how we got here and why the discovery, which was announced last July, was not unexpected. Tomorrow, I'm going to give you all the details you want to know about the discovery itself. So, the identification of the high energy uh, ice cube neutrinos with the blazer, which is a type of AGN. AGN are very complex, even for astronomers. So, the last two lectures are going to be devoted to AGN for physicists. I've done this before, it's, it's fun, on my side. Uh, I'll explain to you AGN starting from the first principles. And there's going to be a lot of material here, so uh, I'm going to be very flexible. I'm going to look at your faces, uh, you interrupt me if I don't understand something, and I'm going to slow down if necessary or expand on some points. Before we start, I want to know how many of you have taken uh, astrophysics classes? Oh, okay, not too bad, not too bad. So, for some of you it's going to be easier than others. But, as I say, um, this is going to be, in a way, most of what I'm saying is outside the other lectures. That's the feeling I have. But I'm here to explain to you uh, AGN. So, uh, for some of you, if some of you have been asleep or hibernating or on holiday for the past few months, this is the, the cover of Science, uh, July 12th, where it was announced that the first identification of neutrinos from the And there was, a, as I said, a lot of uh, press coverage. And uh, it was all over the newspapers, and so I'm going to try to, to tell you how we got there. And I've been working with Lisa Scorning for the past four years on exactly trying to see uh, if blazers could be neutrino sources. Uh, so the plan of the of this first lecture, and uh, the, most of it is in down with Lisa, uh, Paolo, Johnny, and others. Uh, First of all, I'll tell you about neutrinos, but I guess many of you most know more than I do. And then neutrino astronomy, which won't take too long. Then I'll discuss the problem, and then I'll show the three approaches we've taken to solve this problem. And then tomorrow I'll, I'll, I'll take you to, to, the, to the discovery. So, uh, before I start, just make sure that we are on the same uh, page. Uh, a reminder for the physicists that one electron volt is equivalent to 2.4 and 3 hertz, which is what we use in astronomy. Actually, we use angstroms, but I'm going to be nice to you and not only use hertz. Uh, 1 GV, of course, is a billion times that. That takes us into the gamma rays. And 1 TV takes us into the very high energy gamma rays. 1 PV is beyond astronomy, as I say uh, tomorrow, and this is 500 hertz. And in terms of energy, it's quite easy. 1 TV is roughly 1.6 hertz, 1 PV is a thousand times that. And just for fun, a uh, box or uh, a little box of chocolate is about two billion mega electron volts, which is two yotta electron volts. Okay, neutrinos. As I said, you most of you know more than I do, but I want to give you the astronomical uh, side. 
The most important thing about neutrinos, remember, is that they are Italian. They were invented, the name was invented by Giorgio Amaldi, it was publicized by Enrico Fermi. Neutrino in Italian means a small neutrone. Neutrone is the, the big neutron particle, neutrino is a small one. And of course, it's tiny, we don't know how big it is, but it's less than a million, one million for the mass of the electron. As you all know, it's a neutral, it's a weakly interactive particle, it comes in three types. They can change flavor, we all know about this. Uh, maybe you don't know that, or maybe you don't forgot that they are everywhere. Every cubic centimeter of the universe contains 340 cosmic neutrinos, which comes from the Big Bang. There was a time where everything was in uh, uh, equilibrium, even neutrinos were interacting with uh, photons, and then they got frozen out, and this is what we, we have now. The energy, the energy is tiny, probably we'll never be able to see them. It's 0.002 electron volts. Then, and I, I like to say this when I give my public talks, every second, the square centimeters of our bodies is crossed by 11 solar neutrinos. Which is about 10 to 14 seconds, 10 to 14 neutrinos per second to our body. The bodies, the energies in this case is less than about half a million. So at this point, since we don't know anything about that matter, but there is a lecture about that, uh, at the moment they are the second most common part of the universe after uh, photons. Neutrino astronomy, this is going to be a very, very short slide because we only know about two sources, but well, we knew about two sources until uh, very recently. The first one is the Sun. This is a polycino paper from nature, and this is the uh, uh, reaction that astronomers love. This is what keeps the stars shining for, it depends how big they are, but typically 10 million years. So they have protons, they become an uranium, they produce, we have astronomers who only care about this part, the energy part. And then there are two neutrinos, of course, as well. And the energy of these neutrinos, you look at the red curve, and it's about for less than uh, half an million. And then the second source, the last source, was mentioned by Kate in the previous uh, lecture, is Supernova 7A. Supernova 7A was the closest supernova in centuries to us. It exploded when I was a younger student uh, 31 years ago in a large marginal cloud. A few hours before the light, we got uh, three, detector, th three detectors, um, which actually saw neutrinos coming from supernova. It energy is about a few tens of energies. The, uh, the other reaction here is described in a nice review by, by Yanka and Thomas Yanka. And it's when the, the, the star is collapsing, uh, the electron and protons basically are squashed to death, and it produces neutrinos and neutrons. So everything changed uh, in, in about five years ago. Uh, Ice Cube published the first paper on science, in science where he reported the results that they found evidence, significant evidence of high-energy neutrinos, about 30 TVs, uh, coming from ice cube. What is ice cube? Ice cube is the largest neutrino detector in the world. It was built over seven summers by drilling uh, holes with hot boiling water down to about 3,000 meters from the ice. And uh, this is a movie of what uh, uh, ice cube sees. Of course, ice cube doesn't see the neutrinos. It sees the results of the interaction of the with the problems in the ice. And uh, the, this uh, particles emit blue light, blue channel of light, which is seen by the ice cube detectors. So, um, after six years of data, this is what ice cube has published. So, these are the number of events in six years. This is the energy in TVs. You see in blue the uh, atmospheric neutrinos. Luckily, the spectrum is very steep, so we don't have roughly about 100 TVs. They are a minority, so whatever is left there is coming from space. These neutrinos are produced when cosmic rays hit the upper parts of the atmosphere, they produce So, about 100 TVs, there are these black points, and uh, Ice Cube uh, say that there are detected about 82 uh, neutrinos, the significance of 6.5 sigma. Um, these are neutrinos that are called starting events because they are, they, they are seen within the detector. There are other types of events which come outside the detector and the details are irrelevant, but they produce this red line which is in perfect agreement with the black points within the same uh, range. And these are about 50 more neutrinos with a detection of 6.7 sigma. So uh, we are seeing things. 
They are not coming from Earth, so the big question is where are they coming from? And this is where the astronomers come in. This is after the, the way I got into this game, Elisa Rescone, who is Stefan's wife, she, she came to ISO uh, after the science paper, um, December 2013, so five years ago. She gave a colloquium, and uh, I've been working on lasers, uh, energy, astrophysics for many years. After the colloquium, I went to work, and we started talking, and we thought about lasers, so we started working, and uh, we published the first paper six months later, and we've been uh, following this idea that lasers could be neutron sources. And as I keep saying to everybody, this problem cannot, can only be solved by astronomers and physicists working together. Because we don't know the physics, and no face, physicists get lost in the astronomy because astronomy is, 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 is very, very complex. So by working together, we can manage, and I think we've shown that we can do it. Small parameters. So, um, where are these neutrinos coming from? Again, I guess you know more than, than I do about this. They, the only way you can produce them, you have high energy protons, you squash, you crush them against other protons or photons, and you produce pions which decay and produce neutrinos, and also pi zeros which produce gamma rays. So this is going to be very important for what I'm going to say in the rest of the talk. When you have a source of neutrinos, you need gamma rays. And this is this is what the astronomy, the astronomy comes in. No vice versa. There are many ways of producing gamma rays without neutrinos, of course, which is the, what makes the situation quite complex. And uh, this is what I said in writing, uh, the same uh, uh, reactions. So, as I say, proton 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 collisions, you get uh, photons and neutrinos, and, uh, and this is another key point, which we'll come back to later. The energy and the flux of the photons is within the factor of two of the energy and the flux of the neutrinos. So if you're putting the two together, building a spectral energy distribution, or we call it an SED, you have to have some match between the gamma ray photons and the neutrinos if the neutrinos are coming from the source. This is again going to be a key point uh, in the middle. So where are these ice cube uh, neutrinos coming from? This is a, a, a galactic projection, so this is the galaxy, this is the plane of the galaxy, so uh, you're on the plane, the further you are away, you are away from the galaxy. So typically galactic sources are within, say, 10 degrees from the, from the plane. As you can see, the points are all over the place. So they cannot all come from the galaxy. They have to come from other galaxies. And in the ice cube collaboration has put the maximum contribution from the galaxy about 15%. So we know that they are coming from space, they are not coming from the galaxy, they are coming from other galaxies. The problem is that there are two trillion galaxies in the universe, and we have to find out which ones they are. And the further problem is that the air of circles of this, uh, of most of these neutrinos are huge. They can reach 10 degrees. Okay, for you, maybe you don't, don't understand what it is. The moon is half a degree, so 20 si times the size of the moon, that's the air of circle where you're looking for neutrinos. Okay? There are also some other ones, which are typical errors of about one degree. For us, these are huge. Normally, when I do my cross-matching, I have a radio source, and I want to find the counterpart, I'm talking about seconds, arc seconds. So if I look in an optical catalog, I find one, maybe two counterparts. If I do uh, this in, uh, uh, using uh, Tromica tools, you see what we get. So uh, this, is the main, this was the main problem to identify this video. So this is the list. Uh, ISCO publishes the positions, uh, the errors, uh, and so let's just play what I call brute force in the neutrino So we then we let's pick one uh, event, number 17, which has this position and this angular error. I go to uh, Simbad, which is uh, an astronomical tool. You go there, you put the coordinates of the point of anything, and it will tell you the counterparts. I do this, I put my radius, and I hit the maximum of 10,000 counterparts within 11.6 degrees. So I'm not going to go very far. But, uh, of course, physicists and astronomers are very inventive. Inventive that there were many, many possible source candidates which people were, were thinking could be producing neutrinos. And just, I made a list, this is uh, from uh, a review paper by Hannes and Hansen. So extragalactic on the extragalactic side, start from the galaxies, which are remnants, because then you have Protons, which are 
thrown away outside from the Gulf of Supernova and they hit the instant medium, uh, activate the nuclei, and I will expand on that. Activate the nuclei outflows, because black holes, contrary to public wisdom, not only uh, create stuff, but they also throw away stuff. The same idea, you are launching high energy stuff against other material, and so you can produce, you can have problem of collisions. Lasers, and I'll expand on this, especially in the last two lectures. Gamma ray bursts, these are very energetic phenomena. Uh, on the right side, you have particles with rays and blah blah blah. The point is that anything where you have energetic protons bumping to other protons or other photons are going to be into new sources. But the main question is are they going to be within the ice cream sensitivity, which unfortunately is not great, as we realized in the past four years. It's the best we can do now, but it's not optimal. Okay, so uh, how would we how, how would we start uh, um, solving this problem? Remember physics, okay? So if you have a PV neutrino, you have to have protons with at least 10 or 100 PV of energy. Which means, remember that on our, my, uh, 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 what I said earlier, that you have to have photons with similar energy and flux within a factor of two. So we are talking about gamma ray sources. And this is going to limit our number of possible candidates. Gamma ray sources are very rare in the universe. Of all the AGN known, and I, again I'll expand on this in the, in the last lectures, only less than one percent are known gamma ray sources. So okay, this is a, a nice reduction in the number of possible candidates. So our list has uh, sources between an uh, interior between 60 and 2 degrees, which means we're looking for photos between 100 degrees and 4 degrees. Unfortunately, we cannot see these photos for two reasons. First of all, the best we can do right now is 40 TVs with the channel of arrays on the ground, but there is more. We will never be able to see these photos, period. Why? Because of the extra background light. The universe is filled with infrared optical photons. If you have a distant laser emitting very energy photons, these photons will interact with these background photons, photo photo collision, and then produce pairs. So you start from a spectrum which might be very high, and you end up with a spectrum which is attenuated. So of course, the closer you are, the better things are. The further away you are, the, the, light, the higher the chance that you actually interact with, with, the, with, the, with the photons. And this is a, a paper which shows you very nicely. This is the optical depth, and this is the fraction, the attenuation fraction. So let's look at one dd. Let's look at the ratio say, of 0.6, which is this curve. And this redshift, which is not very high for our standards, the highest so far uh, quasar is 7.5, so this is the net of 0.5. For 1 dB, ratio 0.6, you are only less than one photon out of a thousand is going to reach us. So basically, you're going to be totally complete of photons. So these photons, these very energy photons, are going to be totally absorbed by the EVA, basically, the problem. But we can do the best we can, we can anyway. We can look at gamma ray catalogs with the highest energy available. And this is what we did. We used, we used the Fermi 2 FHL catalog, which has a cut of 50 GD. We used 360 sources. There are 360 sources of the galactic plane. We, we avoid the galaxy because the galaxy is, is a mess. And most of them are blazers. And I'll get back to the to, to blazers in a second. And now we use another two catalogs, but the point uh, remains that we wanted to concentrate on gamma resources for what for the reasons I, I mentioned I mentioned them. Okay, so uh, I'll tell you about places uh, in my last lecture, but I need to tell you something now. So this is my the best way I find to tell when I give my public lectures as well. So the universe contains about two trillion galaxies, that's the last the last count. Two trillion galaxies, two thousand billion galaxies. About one percent of them have a massive black hole. Uh, well, no, sorry, we believe that all of them, all the big ones, have a black hole. About 1% of them have a black hole which we call active. If you look at the center of this galaxy, you should not see this very bright spot if the galaxy were normal. This galaxy is not normal, it's active, it's the prototype C1, because there is something there which emits a lot of radiation, typically more than the whole galaxy. We call these objects active and active. So, all the galaxies have a black hole, 1% are active. 
less than 10% of these active galaxies produce jets. These are particles uh, being accelerated by the black hole at very, very fast speeds, close to the speed of light. When these jets are pointed towards us, then the object is called the blazing. So, to recap, neutrino galaxies, 1% the black hole is active, less than 10% they have a jet, and then a small fraction of these jets will point towards us within a factor of 5, 10 degrees, and that's, that's the blazing. If you do the math, less than one galaxy out of 100,000 is a risk. They're very, very, very rare sources. But they're very powerful, so that's all the things. Um, they come into flavors. Uh, maybe for this audience, this is not important. Um, they, have, they emit all over the, the spectrum, from the radio to the gamma ray. This is what they call a spectral energy distribution. This is new and blue, or it's squared in the for physicists. This shows where most of the energy is coming from. This is BLA, the prototype of the BLA class, which is one of the subclasses of this. You can see here that when the object is quiescent, which is the solid line, the optical and the gamma ray balance are equal. When the object is in outburst, most of the energy comes out in the gamma rays. Um, and this I get back again in the, in the last two lectures. We, there are strong indications that we are seeing that it is beaming, which means jets, which are moving very fast, close to C, forming a small land with other side, and this produces amplification and other nice things which we'll, we'll tackle uh, on, on Friday and Saturday. In a nutshell, blazes are size of very energy phenomena. They manage to accelerate photons up to 10 degrees and particles up to 0.9998C. That's the equivalent factor of 50, which is, which is not bad. My favorite definition, the nature's free accelerator. It's much cheaper to do with the base than to build the larger than collider, which explains why many uh, physicists have moved to laser studies uh, to understand uh, 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 the way these things accelerate the power. Okay. Uh, the last thing about lasers, they come in two main classes, which they, 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 this will be important later. If you look at the ACD, this is, we know this is the same mission. And this is the peak of the signal emission. There are two main classes based on, the, on this peak. The ones where the peak of the signal emission is less than 10 to 15 hertz, which is there, are called HPL. This is one of these objects. Why are these important? Because, as you can see here, when, when the peak is low, the gamma ray flux is low. If you push the CD to the right, then you will have more gamma rays and the chance of producing uh, of being a, 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 a neutrino emitter in our view increases. So these are very important for um, neutrino astronomy. Again, according to Elisa, myself, and if you want. Okay, close the parenthesis on blazers. We will we, we, we'll learn more about blazers uh, on Friday and Saturday. So we have this couple of catalogs, we have these neutrino catalogs. How do we try to see? if neutrinos are coming from lasers. We did a very simple statistical analysis. We have these the red dots are the gamma ray catalogs, the, the, the black circles are the neutrinos with their errors. So what we did, we invented a statistic which is called a new. The dangle of the lens with at least one gamma ray catalog. And then we plot and nu as a function of gamma ray flux. And we get some numbers. Then we determine the chance probability by randomizing the positions uh, up to a million times. And then we get the p-value. And I'm going to plot in the p-value as a function of gamma ray flux. So this is the result. So I walk you through because maybe it's not uh, as intuitive the first time you look at it. So this is an integral uh, uh, flux. So this point means all the sources with flux above this value. This is the p value. So this shows you a few things. If you look at the whole curve uh, HL, which is a gamma ray catalog, the red points, there is a minimum here, but it's at uh, the level of about 2%. If you look at the 2 FHL non HPL, remember the HPL are the real lux with a singleton peak above 20 to 15 Hz, they are all the way up there, no signal. The only signal. Well, the only hint 
comes from the HPN, which are the black points, which is a value of 0.4%. This number gives you the number of matches we get. This is the number of random matches we expect, so the difference gives you the number of real counterparts. At this minimum, we get about 5.6 counterparts. Now, this is uh, pre trial. Are you familiar with the post trial correction? I guess I'm not a physicist, are you? No. Yeah. Wow. I thought the only astronomers know about this. <laughs> so, suppose you do uh, 20 statistical tests. Then, by chance, you get the two sigma result. One divided by 20. Um, if you look on Wikipedia, uh, there was a study where they, they looked for uh, the effect of uh, um, high voltage uh, cables on people, and they studied 10,000 illnesses. They got the four sigma result without correcting for the number of trials they did. Once they did that, there was no signal left. So the message is that whenever you do statistics, you have to correct the number of trials you've been using. And if you do that, you get, in this case, not much, because the points are the impact, you go from 0.4 to 1.4%. Now, every astronomer would jump on that, because we are less rigorous than you guys. Of course, I was working with a physicist, and so we said, well, we find a hint that there might be a signal at this relatively high gamma refractions. It could be that, that some of the neutrinos are coming from, from this type of thing. The HPM, the ones with no peak in the measure energy. Then we did all the, the we listed all these this, uh, counterparts, and then we did an important thing. Remember the physics tells us that whenever you have the gamma rays coming from proton proton to photo collisions, you expect that the energy and the flux of the, of the, of the, of the photons and the neutrinos are to, are, to be the, are, are to be the same within the factor of two. So what we did, we built the SEDs of all the sources. We put together the gamma ray points. This is one carrier from the power of the These are the gamma ray points, out of it doesn't matter. And then we put, plotted the flux of the putative neutrino counterpart, assuming this was real, and then we look at the CD. And as you can see here, uh, and this is course the Padovani rule. You, you draw a line, you, you extrapolate, and you look if the line intercepts the red point. And in this case, it does. A nice line there. So we say, OK, good. This point it's not only passes the, yeah, we try to be away from theoretical, any, any theoretical uh, models. So, so the point was the following. Whenever you do this match, you find many blazers within these arrow boxes. But only very few pass this test, which is the energetic test, which is fundamental if you want to have the same, uh, the, the photons and the neutrinos coming from the same uh, uh, process. Uh, as I said, surprising enough, very few of these sources pass the test. This is one which doesn't pass the test. These are the observed photon, photon points. Even if you correct for absorption due to the uh, background photons, you go here. You go here, I mean, you extrapolate down there, you can lose out the way up there. There's no way. And this is another case which is nice. Uh, here, this was a quite high ratio, so when you correct the gamma ray points, you go all the way up there, and uh, the gamma ray points to the new thing. So this is another one. If you do all this out of the many 37 uh, sources, you are left with five. And we call them our most probable matches. Now, there are five others which could be, or not, you know, this is sort of a hand waving. But. So, the, 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 the outcome is the following out of 51 neutrinos, you can have maybe five, possibly ten counter. So, even if blazers of this type are responsible for, neutrino, for neutrinos, they can only explain 10, 20 percent of the ice cube scene, which was uh, 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 by itself. An interesting result. Even if we are right, we can only explain a part, a small part of the ice cube uh, result. So this was the first, uh, the first way we tackled the problem. The second way was a theoretical one. We, we got together with uh, with uh, Maria Tropol, who is a, a theoretician. Uh, this is the SCT again of BLR. Everybody agrees that this part is simple to emission. We have electrons moving in magnetic fields, they produce photons. This type of 
what? Uh, most people prefer to think that it's inverse quantum. The same electrons boost the photos they produce to the gamma rays, and they produce. Uh, and this is how you explain ACD. But if you are, if we are right and you have protons, then you have to have hadronic emission. So the gamma rays have to come from hadrons. And so Maria, with the apostrophe and Dimitra Kudis, had, had this code, which was, called, which was a left hadronic model. She could fit the data of blazers using electrons, gamma rays from electrons, and from protons as well. And this is what we did. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, the code has five parts of operation. You have protons, which lose energy by a variety of processes. You have the electrons, again, chemical radiation, inverse quantum, photons, which gain and lose energy in various ways, neutrons go away, and then the neutrons go away. So this whole thing is described by a set of time-dependent equations. So by the code, it takes a long, a long time to run, but then and then you get something like this. So, the, these points are the photons of Macaria photo 1, and the black line is the fit using electrodronic model. So, a model where the gamma rays come also from protons. This model predicts this neutrino flux in red. To be compared to this point, which is a larger bar, but this is it. Then that's the way it is. So, in this case, as you can see, this is not very far from. Uh, what we could see, assuming that this event is matched to one kind of photo. This also was done for another source, which was actually nice. Again, this is the prediction, the red dotted line, and this is what was observed. So, in the next couple, there are more, three or four cases, even on the theoretical side, which were the cases for which we thought there was the most probable match, we could, we could actually explain the photons and the neutrinos using this electron model. Sorry? Uh, 2015. Uh, yeah, because I was wondering why there is no uh, high energy in the, the like, uh, high energy, or something. Yeah. This is... Uh, this is fair. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this, this is one, This is one, so it's almost 100 Yeah, we, we found... We, we used Kutamori to find, so... If there are no data there, there are 100 million. Okay, so point number two, uh, the, 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 theory, the, the theory approach. Then we ask ourselves another question. Now let's assume that uh, all the LUX are neutrino neutrino sources. Let's assume we have a way of linking the gamma rays to the neutrinos. Can the LUX explain the old signal seen by us? This is a totally different approach. In part of the we've been working on, on a, a simulation which basically the tests are, are relevant. We know how our blazers evolve, we put all the blazers in the computer, and we are in total control. We can reproduce all the properties of blazers in the computer. To this simulation, we add an electronic component based on Maria's model. And this is the, 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 the component. There was only one free parameter the, the relation between the gamma ray and the neutrino flux. And this was determined by comparing the model with the data. So, at the end of the day, we have no free parameters. So these are the ICD data in red, and this is our results. Again, I'm doing something which is very ambitious. I'm taking all the blazers in the universe, I'm assigning to each of them a neutrino flux, and then I'm summing it all up, and then producing this blue curve, which is quite something. As you can see, uh, it's all experience because after the year you cannot you can barely distinguish the two curves. So again, it's the BLX with the high energy signal spectrum. What's the message? It's very simple. They can do it. They can only explain as the data from half a DV onwards, but here they are off by again the usual factor of 10. So even if again, this is this confirms what we found with the other approach. Even if some of the neutrinos come from the LUX, the LUX cannot explain the whole signal of ice cream. Now, now just one yes. Question. One question. Uh, I mean, there on the right side, you have the dots which says excluded upper limits, and your model is there above. 
This is the oratory we got from uh, all these red dots with arrows down. Ah, this was one sigma and this is three sigma. We 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 can make the three sigma, yes. So they're not should be, but but I get there. This is a very very good question, we need to this point. So as you can see, our model predicts a bunch of two, three, four PVs neutrinos, which Ice Cube has not seen. So um, Ice Cube looked at our model and constrained this parameter which we, we used to calibrate the gamma rays in the photons. And so their best value now is this one, which, which lowers the, 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 the model again. Again, the numbers are large, so you can still say that our model explains everything from half a PV onwards, but uh, the point remains that this, this, our curve was probably uh, on the high side. But the point now is, is another one. This is now the big picture. I'm putting together photos and neutrinos. So this is the gamma ray, the ground, as seen by Fermi. This is our simulation of the LAX with Barujomi in gray. And you can see that above at 10 GD, we show, and other people confirm that, the LAX can explain the whole gamma ray background. You see that the gray point, the gray area coincides with the red point. But this point, this plot show that the LAX cannot explain the ice cube background, which is sort of a, an inconsistency. It looks like, like not all the LAX are neutrino factors, which is, which is interesting. Okay. Um, at the end of the first lecture. So, what I told you today, the LAX are great candidates uh, as counterparts of ice cube neutrinos from three different points of view. Uh, we did a statistical approach, a theoretical one, and then a population wide study. We found a signal with a value of about 1.4%, which you can explain again only 10 uh, of the ice cube data. We showed that electronic models can explain the ACD of some VLAX. And this is the work with Maria. And again, the last point, HBM as a class can explain only the high energy part and about 10% of the low energy events. After working for four years on this, we knew that if we were right, ice cube had to detect a BLAC sooner or later. So, just to, 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 to give you a feeling of how we felt. We knew we were right, but we could not prove it. Let's put it this way. So, then, last September, uh, the, the event came, and as I tell you late, tomorrow, it was great to see that the, the, the type of source that was identified as a counterpart was exactly the one we've been discussing for, for the past four years. And a point which remains, even if this is true, that Elisa and I and, and Paolo Jomi and others, we believe that there is plenty of room for other sources. Okay, so the LAX, yes, they are with new sources, but they're not, they cannot explain the full high school scene. And these are the five papers we published with Elisa in the past four years. And I think I'm done. Thank you very much. Did you get lost? <laughs> Please, feel free. Was it okay? This is the easy part. Anything else than from HBM. 
So the other ones, the NDL, gave us no signal at all. There are many federal papers which say that there could be other sources, but I don't believe that Glazers could be explaining uh, that, that part there. The reason is the following, that uh, when you do the math, the energy of the neutrinos scales inversely with the energy of the singleton peak. So ATL explains this part, and the LDL go to much higher energy. So here you should have ultra HPL, which if they are there, they are, they are small now. So your phone, the, the non HPL might be relevant there, as you can see from this, from this, from this graph. The HPL die off here, and you have the other ones. But here, no way. So, with the reason we think that the sources, uh, you know, there are many possibility again outflows, and uh, again, we can chat to you about it, but right now I don't think we, we know, uh, I'm pretty sure that Vegas cannot explain uh, that part of the signal. Of the, of the Can they still be like P-gamma accelerators? Uh, P-gamma interaction 